In Yellowstone, a long forgotten cry rings out. The wolf, once revered as brother, teacher, and worthy rival on these vast hunting grounds, then driven out by fear and mistrust. Now, after more than six decades, a controversial experiment brings the ultimate canine predator back into the heart of the West. There's something about a wolf that is the definition of wildness, the preeminent wild animal. For park biologists like Doug Smith, nothing less than the wild soul of the park is at stake. We have persecuted them for so long, they've come to be a symbol about what humans have done wrong, and now a symbol about what humans can fix. A lifelong fascination with wolves has brought Doug here, anxious to learn how this ancient place will respond to the return of its top dog. In the process, he will find himself swept up in the unfolding saga of one wild canine family. Its hardships and affections, its losses and its triumphs. The Druid Peak Pack is the only pack in the park where we know every individual, literally the ebb and flow, the pulse of their life is something that we've been able to record. Join us now as we track the fortunes of the Druids, a wolf pack reborn in the crucible of Yellowstone. High in the plateaus of the Rocky Mountains, an alchemy of earth, wind, fire, and ice works a singular magic. Most of the world's geysers spew and sputter here, marvels that inspired a novel idea in 1872, the creation of the world's first national park. Here, the great creatures we almost exterminated in our rush westward would make their last stand and stage a comeback. Now another comeback has the world holding its breath. Canis Lupus, the gray wolf, is making a new debut on this wild stage. are one of the hardest animals to watch. They're shy, they're secretive, they live in remote areas. To get a look at a wolf is, for some people, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And here in Yellowstone, we're seeing rare natural process with a front row seat. Biologist Doug Smith heads the wolf reintroduction program. Now making his rounds from the air, he is about to be rewarded with an extraordinary sight. Yeah, right there, yeah, yeah, okay. Below him, an ancient life and death saga plays out. North America's premier predator, the wolf, has taken down its most intimidating prey, a bison. It's a sight not seen here since the early 1900s, a time when wolves were less than welcome. A century ago, many thought the only good wolf was a dead one. 
reviled as a threat to livestock, the canines were hunted down across the country. The Park Service joined in the effort, and by the 1930s, Yellowstone could be declared wolf-free. And so it remained for more than 60 years. In the 1970s, the new conservation movement inspired plans to return the wolf to Yellowstone. Plans that would be blocked again and again by neighboring ranchers who feared for their livelihoods. But by 1995, the decision was made, and the wolves were coming home. 14 furry recruits all the way from Canada made their way into the park amidst curiosity, controversy, and jubilation. For those who had fought for the return of the wolf, it was a moment of triumph and trepidation. The feeling of participating in something historic was an overriding feeling. It was literally 20 years of effort and work to bring these animals back. Arguably the most controversial predator in all of North America. You know you're doing something worthwhile, something much bigger than yourself. It's a tremendous feeling. The plan? To introduce several imported packs over the course of three years. For the first 10 weeks, they would be kept in pens to get acclimated and to shed any tugs of homesickness. The human's task? To convince the wolves that Yellowstone was full of good things to eat without allowing them to get too fond of the hands that fed them. The biggest challenge was maintaining all these wolves in pens, keeping these wolves well-fed, and unbothered by people. Wolves don't like people. And these wolves never got used to us inside the pen. Absolutely no habituation to us. Afraid that some of the wolves might reject each other in these close quarters, the biologists were relieved to find they were consorting in the age-old way. This litter was conceived in the pen. It seemed the canines were taking to Yellowstone, but would Yellowstone take to them? This is the Lamar Valley, the intended home for several of the introduced packs. Teeming with wildlife, the Lamar has been dubbed the Little Serengeti of North America. But for more than six decades, it was a Serengeti without its lion. In a wolfless world, the mantle of top dog had fallen to the wolf's smaller cousin, the coyote. Wily, perhaps. Hungry, definitely. But the coyote is no wolf when it comes to prey the size of elk. Even a naive deer fawn finding itself in the coyote's hungry sights has more than a fighting chance against so small a predator. Coyotes take a toll on newborn elk and deer, but a five-month-old fawn is more than his match. The fearsome grizzly might seem a fitting successor to the wolf, but elk evolved with the swifter canine nipping at their heels. Once the calves are two months old, the herd has little to fear from the great bear. Without the wolf, the park was missing its top predator, and some scientists were concerned about the consequences. Not having the wolf here created an imbalance 
and we want to restore that balance. There are very few wild places left in the lower 48, and we're trying to kind of say, stop and restore wildness. We want nature to function the way it was, not how humans have made it. The moment of truth has arrived. After 10 weeks in the pen, the wolves watch intently as biologists cut a hole in the fence. They've already spurned the open front gate. It reeks of humans. Even the new opening seems untrustworthy until the alpha male makes a momentous decision. One's out. With each canine release, human spirits soar. Two, two are out. Many people were tearful. The emotional burden that was lifted off of people's shoulders was tremendous. Now, what was going to happen? Would this take? Would the wolves go back to Canada? What are they going to do? Spring 1996, one Canadian wolf pack makes its American debut. Their alpha male leads them into the wilderness under the shadow of the mountain that will become their namesake. With Druid Peak as a backdrop, the pack sorts itself into the strict hierarchy of wolf social life. Big number 38 settles into the role of top dog or alpha male. Number 38 was a monstrous individual, bigger than most wolves. He's the only wolf that broke out of his cage on the way to Yellowstone. Together, he and his mate, number 40, make a handsome matched pair. The alpha female is playful and affectionate with him. But she'll quickly earn a reputation as perhaps the fiercest wolf in the pack. Number 40, the alpha female, is all business. She runs the pack. I mean, when she gets up, she's got to look to her face that I'm either going to beat up on my sister, I'm going to kill a coyote, I'm going to kill an elk, I'm going to kill another wolf, but I'm going to go out there and do something. And she doesn't rule it in a forgiving way. It's put up or get out. She kicked her mother out of the pack. She's kicked one of her sisters out of the pack. And she's in process of kicking a second sister of hers out of the pack. That second sister, number 42, is the Cinderella of the pack. She works hard and spends most of her free time groveling before her betters, the alpha pair. Her days with the pack are numbered. Sooner or later, she will almost certainly be driven out. Still, she clings to the only family she's ever known. The druids are a well-oiled machine. They kind of move with a certain swagger that says, watch out, elk, and watch out, other wolves. We own this chunk of Yellowstone. But swagger is not enough in this wilderness. The lifeblood of the pack is the hunt, and it may take several good kills a week to keep these dogs well-fed. With their easy, ground-eating strides, the pack appears deceptively casual about the business of the hunt. Each in tune with the rhythm of the chase, they pass the baton of pursuit from wolf to wolf. They seem to be thoroughly enjoying themselves. Only when their prey shows signs of tiring will they turn deadly serious. Alpha female is fleet and determined. But her Cinderella sister is the real greyhound of the pack.
It seems the druids will have no problems feeding themselves, but starvation is not the only danger here. Right after release, the druid peak pack had their territory in and around the Mar Valley. They rarely left. Abruptly, one time they did leave though, and they left up Cache Creek and crossed a pass, and they left the park, which isn't as protected an area, and it put them in possible danger. Because there's a lot of people out there who really hate wolves, and we're worried. Beyond the boundaries of the park, all the wolves would be at risk, but the huge alpha male would be the one to pay the ultimate price. Day after day, the team monitors the pack's movements, and then comes the sound they dread, a signal indicating a wolf hasn't moved in five hours. Big number 38 is dead, shot, perhaps by a hunter or a rancher. To lose the alpha male is a significant blow. The alpha male is a dominant animal in the pack. It directs the pack, leads the pack, does a lot of the killing, and most importantly, is a breeder. So here, the alpha female was without a mate. She had no way of reproducing that year. And so it was a possibly fatal blow to that pack. Eventually, the remaining druids straggle back into the park, only to find an intruder in their territory. It's a young male from the neighboring Rose Creek pack in search of a place to call his own and a mate. But he's on dangerous turf. Twice before, members of his clan were killed when they strayed into Druid territory. But something tells him the Druids are not what they used to be. The missing bass note in the Druid's mournful chorus may confirm his suspicions. No alpha male giving voice. What now unfolds has rarely been witnessed and never before caught on film. During a six-hour game of cat and mouse, the druids test the newcomer. A wolf joining another pack really comes down to life or death for that wolf. If it works out, that animal's gonna breed and maybe breed for many years. If it doesn't, they're dead in an instant. And I got the impression that it was up to that wolf trying to join the pack, that it was truly a test of his social skills. And it was just hanging on a hair about how it would come out. He stood there, and all the other wolves came to him. And he stood his ground. First the alpha female, then the beta female. And watching it, it was almost as if like they were testing what he would do. And he stood there, he looked at him, and he wagged his tail. With a wolfish embrace, the deal is sealed. The Druid Peak Pack has its new alpha male. It's time for introductions all around, and everyone seems thoroughly delighted with the newcomer.
With winter creeping into the Lamar Valley, Doug and his team keep a close eye on the pack. Over there. And they had that calf kill right over here. Right. Maybe they're back hanging around there. One question is now uppermost in their minds. Will the new druids prove as efficient a hunting unit as the old druids? Their survival as a pack will depend on it. Wolves are classic sifters and sorters. Wolves take a look at a herd of elk and they have a keen eye and they are, they are literally easing through those animals looking for something awry. And they kind of go around like they're not doing anything, but they're watching every single animal in that herd. And once they see something not quite right, they're like a fighter pilot locking in on a target, and they know. You can see their whole disposition change. From an easy lope, they turn it up to a just full out, straight out gallop. I've seen situations where elk who have been targeted by wolves try and lose themselves in a group of comrades, and it doesn't work. The wolf has got its eye on that elk, and no matter what it does, they can't get away. tonight for the new druids and for an enterprising scavenger or two. The wolves gorge themselves at the carcass. Each may consume 20 pounds of meat at a sitting. Afterwards, meat drunk, they stagger off to digest their meal from a vantage point where they can keep a lazy eye on their kill. A coyote senses that the new alpha male is a tolerant sort when well fed. But the rest of the druids are notorious for killing coyotes, so he'd better have eyes in the back of his head. The alpha female, though full and bloodied from her meal, is not about to let a mere coyote filch from her carcass. But the coyote cannot turn down the opportunity for a free meal and decides to push his luck. The alpha female has had enough. The powerful wolf has a higher top speed than the coyote, and she's three times its size. A single slip might be fatal. With full stomachs, the druids finally relent. An eagle picks over the now uncontested carcass. But the bird won't be the last to pick over the kill. The biologists, too, have something to glean from the grim remains of the elk. What kind of impact are the wolves having on the other creatures of Yellowstone? A little forensic work at the scene provides some valuable clues. One of the things we're trying to learn about is what kind of elk wolves are killing. Are wolves killing elk at random, or are they very, very selective? Pretty well cleaned up. 
jawbone. Wolves are not just killing any animal they want. There are certain things that make an animal vulnerable to wolf predation. She's probably 15 plus years old at least. Worn teeth give Doug a good idea of how old the elk was. But a glimpse into the bone marrow will prove even more telling. Yeah, it should look like peanut yeah. butter, white and... It's all red. This elk was old, very old, probably 15 years or older, and the marrow on it is in very poor condition. So this animal was barely hanging on, and the wolves spotted that, and that's probably why they attacked her and were successful. Wolves are not random killers, but wolves are very selective killers. They have to find an animal that's got a problem before they can bring it down. If this elk was healthy, there's a good chance it wouldn't have been killed. Except in high summer, snow can sweep into the Lamar Valley in an instant. For biologists suddenly working in near blizzard conditions, the weather is instructive in its own way. We love it out here. And if you didn't love <laughs> weather like this, you couldn't study wolves because Winter time is the wolves' favorite time of year by far. This is what they're out in, and they act like that doesn't even bother them. And here's an animal that has to get kicked in the head every time they want to go eat. And they look like life is just grand. Oblivious to all this hardship, out there on their own. And really, I think the key to life is just don't think about it too much. Do the best you can. Take your hard knocks. Don't worry about the ones that are coming in the future. And maybe if that's a lesson for me, then I'll take it. But philosophy can be cold comfort when winter comes in earnest. For the grazing animals, finding even a few mouthfuls of grass becomes a chore. And moving through the deep snow seems a Herculean task. The season does not tolerate weakness of any kind. An injured owl attracts hungry curiosity from all quarters. In the end, it is the coyote who delivers the final blow. Even the winter-loving wolf struggles in the first deep powder of the season. Bull elk have joined forces for protection, and this early in the season, they're still well-fed. Their elegant defensive formations and the deep powder foil the hungry wolves. Even in better conditions, only about one in four hunts is successful. And on this snowy day, the druids will go hungry. The smallest canine in the park, the red fox, seems barely to have noticed the return of the wolf. He's intent on his own supper and prefers to hunt by aerial attack. Today's quarry, little rodents like mice and voles. As 
winter progresses, snow melts and refreezes, forming a hard crust. The park's great herd struggled to find grazing. Elk, weakened by hunger, sense they are vulnerable. Dozens of generations of living without wolves have not begun to ease their fear of the predator. But this ancient battle is never one-sided. The elk have lost none of their impressive defenses against wolves. Speed and sharp hooves even the odds, and desperation lends strength even to a starving elk. Being a wolf is tough. I mean, they get kicked, they get walked on, they get broken ribs, and that's what they have to go through on a daily basis to get a meal. Still, the resilient druids seem to come out of each hunt unscathed and in high spirits. As always, the thunder of hooves gets their attention. It is an enormous herd of elk coming their way. But trouble follows on its heels. Out of the adjacent valley comes the much larger Rose Creek wolf pack. There is no love lost between the two clans. Now the Rose Creeks pass through the no wolf zone that separates the two packs territories, still intent on the elk. The Druids dare not confront the larger Rose Creek pack, but they've been quick to kill stragglers before. and a single young male has wandered a little too far onto their turf. Wolves are, are fiercely territorial. For a trespassing wolf caught in the Druid Pack territory, it's almost always fatal. They'll be killed if they're caught. Belatedly, the intruder realizes his mistake and hightails it for home. Well out of their turf do the druids relent. The pack now makes a show of remarking their boundaries. The alpha male, once a Rose Creek pup himself, leaves a chemical do not trespass sign for his kind. And the intruder, chastised, heads back to his own valley. Between hunts and border skirmishes, there's time to relax. The Cinderella of the pack senses it's safe to invite her alpha sister to play. Soon there's a general outbreak of high spirits. It's said that every dog has its day, but the druids, like most wolf packs, have come to own the night. It is their favorite time to hunt.
By the light of the full moon, the alpha female leads the attack. Their intended target, a winter-weakened elk cow, is not about to go down without a fight. But on this icy night, the odds are changing in the wolves' favor. The snow is crusted over, and the elk's thin legs crash through, slowing her down with every stride. The wolves' enormous webbed paws keep them on the surface, moving with deadly speed over the rough terrain. As dawn breaks over the Lamar, a hungry coyote picks his way across the valley toward the scene of the druid's night kill. The wolves have already eaten their fill. The coyote approaches at its peril and hesitates as if calculating the risk. For scavengers on the wing, the return of the wolf has been an unmitigated blessing. A small wolf pack like the druids can eat less than half a 500-pound elk at a sitting, leaving a banquet for ravens and eagles who are thriving on the top dog's leftovers. Not so the coyote. Fully half of its kind have disappeared where the wolf has been reintroduced. Life has changed significantly for coyotes. They have to look over the shoulder a lot more now than they ever did before. These coyotes can't pass up a meal in the middle of winter that wolves provide. And literally, if these coyotes don't look over their shoulder enough, they're gonna find a wolf coming and it's game over. Spring comes late to Yellowstone, but by May, the Lamar Valley is finally shedding its winter coat. generation is kicking up its heels in exuberant rites of spring. Even the young coyotes seem to be thriving. With the adult population down, there is more food to go around, and the pup's survival rate is actually up.
The druids have come through the winter in fine form and soon will have their own young to look after. For a Cinderella wolf, this is bad news. Her sister's fuse is growing short and soon even groveling will fail to appease her. Somewhere in the Lamar Valley, the druid's alpha female has picked a summer homestead, one Doug is anxious to find, but not to disturb. This is uh, the Druid Peat Pack's den, and we pretty much stay back from this area so we don't disturb or interfere with them. But they've got five pups this year, both gray and black, and a great deal of anticipation because that's more than last year. Now more than ever, the biologists must keep their distance, settling for brief glimpses of this new phase in the pack's life. Wolves love puppies. In spring, the nurturing hormone prolactin is peaking in the entire pack, not just the nursing female. This ensures that every member of the pack, male or female, is eager to care for the young. No adult wolf can resist a pup. The pups tug on their ears, climb on their backs, and that adult just sits there good-naturedly, almost smiling. Bringing back toys, throwing it with the pups. It's almost like pups are the biggest joy for the entire pack. Meanwhile, the pups grow strong, learn the rudiments of the chase, master the body language of the wolf, and find out exactly where they rank in the pack hierarchy, at the bottom. In the valley below, elk are also taking in the spring. Few prey species have been more closely honed by the strengths of a predator than the elk by the wolf. In size, speed, grace, all the way down to her sharp, lightning-quick hooves, the elk owes much of her streamlined design to the great canine's pursuit through the ages. Her extravagant trot and nose-up posture may have evolved not just for keeping an eye on predators, but also to impress them with her fitness. During calving season, the elk have every keen sense attuned to the possibility of ambush in the deep grass. Elk are fierce defenders of their newborns, and many a wolf has been trampled by an outraged elk mother. Elk calves are vulnerable. The only hope an elk calf has is the mother. If you can get mom away long enough to just grab that calf, you usually will come away with the prize. The prize, however grisly, means food for his own hungry young. The druid pups, it seems, have a thoroughly modern dad. He spends as much time as anyone else in the pack feeding his brood.
Nearby, a coyote mother attempts to muster her rambunctious clan. Her den and that of the druids are too close for comfort, and she's in a constant state of agitation. With good reason, it turns out. It's the druid Cinderella passing through on her way back to the pack. Even here, she gets no respect. When their pups are at risk, coyotes don't hesitate to take on a wolf three times their size. The hapless wolf is soon driven off. But now that their denning grounds have been discovered, the coyotes will take no chances. It's time to move the pups, and in a hurry. The search is on for a new hideout, and along the banks of a river they find a likely spot. This place, though soggy, looks wolf-proof. Our Cinderella wolf returns to the druid's den at last. But if she expects an enthusiastic welcome from her alpha sister, she is sorely mistaken. The relationship between the alpha female and the beta female, sisters, is a tightrope. You never know when the alpha female is going to snap and attack the beta female. And you never know how long that beta female is going to put up with it, if she's going to stay or leave. So it's really like a tightrope, never knowing how it's going to come out. Stay or leave, stay or leave. It's now August, and the creatures of Yellowstone make the most of the last days of the short summer. The season brings a lonely rite of passage for one animal. For the Cinderella sister of the Druid Peak Pack, the hounding has become relentless. This time, the judgment is final. Her fleetness of foot and her courage at the kill no longer warrant a place in the pack. She slinks away with her tail between her legs, glancing back for a sign of reacceptance that never comes. In the ancient way of the wolf, she must strike out on her own. Her best chance for survival is to find her own mate and her own territory. Striking out on your own is always risky. You've got to kill by yourself. You may not find a territory. You may not find a mate. The life of the lone wolf is hard. But if you can find a mate and a territory, your future can be very good. For now, her future is uncertain, as is that of all the Yellowstone wolves.
Recently, some packs have strayed outside the park, placing themselves in danger and disrupting a uniquely American way of life. For generations, Martin Davis's family have been ranchers. It becomes a way of life. It's just part of you to be out with your cattle, and it's something that's in your blood. I mean, we've got a lot invested in these cattle. There are life savings tied up in these cattle. Recently, Martin was horrified to find 13 wolves near his herd. He hasn't lost any livestock yet, but he's convinced that day is bound to come. I, I think it's inevitable, whether they're not in our cattle today or this year, but next year, someday, that wolf's gonna trot by and he's gonna be hungry, but someday they will take one of our cattle. For people who live near Yellowstone, those fears are very real. As for Doug, he's now come to the hard part of his job, finding a way for two icons of the American West to coexist. If he and other advocates for the wolf should fail, the unthinkable happens. The wolf may once again be removed from Yellowstone. I've been with them since day one and I carried every wolf in. And I opened the doors to the pens, and I've watched this wolf population grow. And so in a way, the thread of my existence has gone through those wolves. They have been the biggest constant in my life. Oblivious to the human dilemmas of biologists and ranchers, the wolves continue to make their own way in Yellowstone. And sometimes even wolves find fairy tale endings. Finally, the Cinderella sister meets a potential Prince Charming. Whether they start a new pack or go separate ways, they have taken their place in this wilderness, another piece in the untamed puzzle that is Yellowstone. I think Yellowstone's complete now with the return of the wolf. Having them back brings Yellowstone back to its primeval state. And so now the basic idea is to let it go and to not come in with human ideas of how it should be, but come in in a way with wolf ideas and elk ideas and grizzly bear ideas on how Yellowstone should be. And our job is just to let it go. After this film was completed, the Druid saga took a dramatic turn. The Cinderella sister returned to the pack from time to time. She was still subservient to her dominant sister, but the balance of power was about to shift. In May, park biologists found the alpha female by the side of the road, badly mauled. It was the work of other wolves, perhaps the Cinderella sister and the rest of the pack. Despite their best efforts, the Yellowstone team could not save her life. As for the Cinderella sister, she was soon observed with a litter of her own. She moved her young to the pack's main den and adopted her sister's orphan pups as well. The once cringing beta was now a confident alpha. For now, the wolves' home in Yellowstone seems secure. A recent federal court decision affirmed their right to live here, but it may take more than a legal ruling to put the controversy to rest. Wolves cannot recognize human boundaries or human laws. And so long as humans fear them, their future will remain uncertain.